When I was six years old, I wanted to grow up to be an astronaut ballerina dolphin trainer. <laughs> now, I don't mean I wanted to be those professions individually. I wanted my job title to be astronaut ballerina dolphin trainer because why wouldn't any adult not want to have that rock star occupation? Well, besides the fact that this profession doesn't actually exist, as I grew older, and the reality of the world desensitized my six-year-old dreams, I came to the realization that I should have a job that was a bit more realistic. So fast forward 10 years, this is me. Yep, that's me wearing a marching band uniform that looks attractive on absolutely no one. <laughs> now, as a 16-year-old, I think I was a pretty good student. I enjoyed reading and was really good at math but those subjects were hardly on my radar as my love for marching band overshadowed them all. I mean, I loved marching band so much that in those moments, I wanted to grow up to become a professional marching band field show creator. Yeah, to me, that was a profession that was going to take me to some incredible places. Music was my life. So you would think that having such a strong passion for a creative outlet would have transcended with me into adulthood. Well, to be completely honest with you, it didn't quite go according to plan. At least, not how I pictured it would be. Because instead of becoming this marching band field show creator, I now stand before you today holding a doctorate in mechanical and aerospace engineering. <laughs> yeah, not so much really that music profession I thought I would have. But in reality, the characteristics of what I loved when I was six, 16, and the person I am today are really not all that different. In today's society, we are all taught that we fit into these separate black and white boxes of personality and professional types, as either being left-brained, those individuals who are more analytical, such as scientists, or right-brained, those individuals who are more creative, such as artists, where there's really not this gray type of area of capability between the two but maybe that's just my perception. So in order to provide you the most accurate information as possible, I sent my family and friends a survey and received around 100 responses to my questions asking them what they perceived were the personality differences between an artist and scientist and what they think these individuals do on a daily basis. So first, let's start with the scientist. Beyond the Bill Nye Mythbusters and Big Bang Theory of references I actually did receive, the top five summarized responses what others perceive a scientist does on a daily basis include, they like to work in a lab, they like to dig in the dirt, they like to mix some chemicals, they also enjoy wearing a lab coat as well as writing on a clipboard, and finally, they like to analyze large amounts of numbers and try to draw conclusions. And remember, as we go through, these are adult responses. <laughs> now for the personality types. They are logical and structured. They are analytical, critical thinkers and are data-driven, can sometimes be nerdy, as well as socially handicapped. And my absolute personal, personal favorite response, they are insensitive robots. <laughs> now moving on to an artist. The top five summarized responses of what others perceive an artist does on a daily basis include they are creating a vision, they are expressing emotion, they are practicing coaching, doing ensemble work. They are at rehearsals and doing performances. And they are practicing sculpting, music -ing. Normally this is being accomplished in someone's basement for some reason. And now for their personality types. They are creative. They are carefree or laid back. They can be passionate or emotional. They are outgoing individuals who love wine. <laughs> And finally, they are eccentric, kind of like Bob Ross eccentric. <laughs> so maybe my perceptions really weren't so different from everyone else's, that we all get placed into these separate categories as either being left brained, those individuals who have more characteristics like a scientist, or right brained, those individuals who are more passionate, such as artists. But what if I told you there actually does exist this happy medium where both of these worlds collide into one beautiful, equally sided brain. 
where both arts and sciences come together to inspire each other. Now, being a scientist myself, I'm about to show you a world where an artistic approach to solving scientific problems exists. But first, going back to those people who believe a scientist is all about analyzing large amounts of numbers and trying to draw conclusions, I'm not telling you that that doesn't happen, because it definitely does. An engineer will spend hours staring at a computer screen trying to draw conclusions from data files that kind of look like this. Yeah, that looks absolutely fun, right? <laughs> so instead of trying to draw conclusions from data files full of numbers, I prefer to solve my engineering problems using non-traditional creative methods, such as this idea of exploring the world around us through image processing and flow visualization, much like this. What you're seeing here is a still image of a fluid jet that has been injected into a stagnant tank of water. This, what you're seeing is what happens when you have a velocity difference between two fluids. This phenomenon is known as Kelvin Hemholtz instability, a theory that was developed in 1868, which describes how a jet's boundary layer will roll up into these absolutely beautiful vortex rings. Although this is something that was created in a laboratory setting, this phenomenon is seen everywhere in the universe. For example, in the planet Jupiter's red spot, and most importantly, in our cloudy sky here on Earth, which is what, is what, is what inspired Van Gogh to paint his infamous Starry Night painting in 1889. Okay, I just showed you a pretty picture. What does that have anything to do with data analysis? Quite a bit, actually. <laughs> First, I'll tell you how something like this can be created or captured, then how we analyzed it. So all you need to conduct image analysis is a camera, a light source, my personal favorite being a laser, and finally, if, if you're doing flow visualization, you may need a flow tracer, such as a dye or particle marker. Any flow visualization effort results in unique image sequence that is dependent on external factors, such as your camera resolution, the type of camera lens that you're using, your light intensity, and the subject of the image. For this case, is our jet flow structures. Now that we've taken a picture or an image, we can now analyze it. An image or picture is actually considered a two-dimensional grid distribution of pixels. If you zoom in on an image a little bit further, you can see this a little bit better. Inside each individual pixel is a single color, which represents the light intensity. In computer software, these color get translated into numbers, where the brighter the pixel, the higher the number it receives. So a picture can be recreated into units or patterns of units that can be mathematically analyzed. So image processing is the process of taking an image or a video, uploading this into computer software, which can translate it into numbers. A computer code is then developed to find changes or patterns within these numbers to extract meaningful information. Now, in the case of a fluid jet, you can get information such as tracking how these vortex rings travel downstream over time, or their frequency of formation by conducting a spectral analysis. It's absolutely incredible how much meaningful information you can obtain from just one single image. All right, so what I showed you was something that was captured that confirms a theory that was developed in um, the 1860s. What about discovering something new? Well, my friends, here you go. What you're seeing here may look like a bunch of random sparkly things moving around the screen. You are correct, actually. These are a bunch of random sparkly things moving around the screen. <laughs> However, these random sparkly things are actually particles that are tracking a moving fluid. And these particles are 30 micrometer in size which is approximately one-third the size of a single strand of human hair. This video only represents two seconds in real time, but was captured at 2,500 frames per second, which is 100 times faster than any action-packed movie you've ever seen. <laughs> now, once analyzed with computational codes to track how these particles move, this video provides information for what we know today as the energy cascade. Turbulent flows are made up of eddies of different sizes. And the energy cascade describes how kinetic energy gets handed down from these large eddies 
to these smaller eddies, to these even smaller eddies, where finally energy gets dissipated as heat through viscous action. However, this energy cascade you are seeing here is unlike any other energy cascade out there as it was the first of its kind to be captured for a multi-phase flow. This video, full of random sparkly things, provides information that helps us understand how blood can get damaged on the cellular level while going through a heart pump or a dialysis machine. And at the exact same time, this video provides information that helps us understand how we can destabilize fires that are trapped in buildings as well as how hot water plumes at the bottom of the ocean floor transfer nutrients that allow deep sea life to prosper. And finally, this video full of random sparkly things provides information that can help us better design safer containment buildings for nuclear reactors. And that was all captured in this one single video that lasts only two seconds long. Now that's a pretty powerful artistic approach to solving more than one scientific problem. Now, the videos that I showed you are not the only image analysis that are happening in the world today. There have been amazing strides in industries such as the space industry, the creation of self-driving vehicles, improving medical device designs, as well enhancing performance of Olympic athletes, just to name a couple. <laughs> so if all these amazing discoveries are occurring with image analysis, why isn't everyone aware or accepting of it? Well, people are cautious of what they consider outside a standard or norm. Image analysis is a softer approach to solving a hard scientific problem, and one in which does not traditionally fit into this idea of what we consider data analysis. Because of this, it's sometimes hard for people to understand or accept. However, I'm a firm believer in the saying that people believe what they see. If we were able to analyze data this way, it adds this additional layer of being able to quantify what we physically can see using math. And that's pretty powerful. So this misconception on whether or not this is a valid analysis approach stems again from those separate black and white boxes of personality and professional types that the world has designated for us. And one in which the STEAM movement is trying to overcome STEAM, spelled S-T-E-A-M, is a movement that is promoting both the arts and sciences into one platform. Hence STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, plus the arts. However, there is this notion by some that there still should be the separation between the arts and sciences to prevent any time and resources being taken away from STEM education. This perspective is mainly fueled in part by the fear that our country is falling behind in the STEM fields and that we are not attracting enough of the younger generations to want to become our future innovators of tomorrow. However, the STEAM movement is not about lessening any efforts on enhancing the science fields to make room for art. It's actually about sparking the imagination of the younger generation that allows them to apply creative thinking and design skills in their lives. And it's about getting them excited about science so they actually want to become our future innovators. Now, it's important to note that image analysis is not the only creative approach to solving scientific problems that exist today, but it is a fun and imaginative way of conducting analysis. So the next time you see a picture, I want you to think of it more like a piece of data, but with an artistic soul. And maybe knowing this creative approach to science exists, it may inspire someone out there to pursue something they never knew was possible, breaking through this misconception between the division of arts and sciences. Maybe it'll inspire someone who is neither left or right-brained, but is equally analytical and creative. Maybe it'll inspire someone who's kind of like me, who loves music, but is also really good at math. Or maybe, just maybe, It'll inspire someone who is six years old, who wants to grow up to be an astronaut ballerina dolphin trainer. <laughs>